Let me talk to you about what we're doing to actually hack the software for life. It turns out that over the last 150 years, uh, although we've had numerous uh, setbacks during that time, we've uh, achieved collectively something quite extraordinary in the doubling of human life expectancy. That occurred primarily through progress in control and prevention of infectious diseases and most specifically in the prevention of early childhood deaths. The amount of suffering that this has relieved is, is actually extraordinary, but, but actually quickly forgotten. Because a couple of generations ago, all of you would have known families that lost often multiple children in early childhood. Now it's actually, as a result of this progress, it's quite rare. Um, children born in many parts of the world today, 85% um, uh, of them can be expected to reach the age of 65, and at least 42% of them are likely to celebrate an 85th birthday. But ironically, although predictably, um, this victory is associated with the unveiling of a new and fundamental challenge to health and healthcare that we are coping with very poorly at the present time in the form of age-related chronic diseases. What I'm gonna to suggest to you today is that genomics and the technologies that support genomics are going to provide the fuel uh, for the next sprint in progress um, in extending human life expectancy, not only in dealing with age-related chronic diseases, but actually moving us beyond um, that species defined um, life expectancy of about 100 years. Um, this is the hacker in chief. Um, there is no single person that has brought the future closer um, than it would have been um, um, other than Craig Venter, who in 1995 uh, became frustrated with the government funded effort to sequence the whole human genome sequence and created a set of tools in the process of sequencing the first bacteria in 1995 that he then applied to the first full human genome sequence, beating the government effort using private sector funding. He went on to describe the microbiome for the first time out of his institute in 2006. And in 2010, he actually did something that was a watershed moment for humanity, and that is the creation of synthetic life where he sat at a computer, wrote down the linear DNA code, built that, that piece of, of genomic material in a yeast cell, put it in a membrane, and booted up life from scratch. He's gone on to build on that, that effort in 2016 with some remarkable work that I think is worthy of a Nobel Prize. Uh, it's described in, in this book, um, which is which is serious science and, and well worth your, your, your time and energy in reading. Um, two and a half years ago, um, I, working with Craig and, and others, um, felt like there was a convergence of four trends that provided a special moment in time where we could actually begin to scale whole genome sequencing for use in human health and the practice of medicine. It's a result of the tremendous reduction in cost of sequencing that all of you are aware of. Craig spent $100 million in 2000 to sequence the first whole human genome. Um, that price in our hands has dropped to about 1300. It's about double that when you add the analytics, but an extraordinary reduction in cost similar to what we've seen in other technology domains. Uh, but it's not only that, it's the computational power that all of you are aware of that we have now. When Craig did this in 2000, 2001, he actually had to have a custom computer built by Compact at the cost of $52 million. You'll love this. It had a teraflop and a half of computational power. You can now order that on your laptop from Amazon for about $200. An extraordinary leap in progress uh, to handle the data that we're generating and sequencing. Finally, machine learning. Um, it's not new, but it's really, um, it's really gone mainstream. Um, th 
through quality of the algorithms and also the exponential availability of data. Uh, and then finally, the transition in healthcare. Um, it's not where we'd like it to be, but it is in the process of being incentivized to move from volume-based reimbursement to value-based care. Our sole focus at Human Longevity is this, to predict everything that can be predicted from the human whole genome sequence. We think it's gonna be much more, much richer source of information than most people at this time realize. We are at the very beginning of this journey. Uh, this is our business model, um, and it is Human Longevity Incorporated. We're a for-profit company, not an institute, as was mentioned in the in introduction. Um, we are building four pieces of critical infrastructure that I'll talk about today to support the platform you see. We do not do fee-for-service genome sequencing. We are in the business of building integrated health records that at the foundation have whole genome sequencing, but are extensively annotated with high quality clinical or phenotype data to allow us, on the rest of the platform, allow us to translate the language of biology in the form of linear DNA code into the language of health and disease. Our intent as a business is to provide that value to pharmaceutical industry, to health and life insurers, and healthcare providers, and to be that engine that does that translation work for people. Uh, we do that by putting these integrated health records on a computational platform. We use Amazon. We are already one of their larger, largest customers, running, uh, storing 24 petabytes of data on their cloud. Um, unlike our peers in that, in that level of storage, we have incredibly demanding computational requests that Amazon actually cannot deliver against in some cases. So we're right at the, right at the borderline of, of what capability exists in cloud computing. Machine learning, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the efforts that we have done to tune that capability. The main outcomes of this effort, of this infrastructure, are new diagnostics and therapeutics and new medical care models. We think this is the vision uh, for the future of not only discovery, but for support of, of medical models. We just published a landmark paper uh, describing for the first time deep sequencing of 10,000 um, human genomes. Um, we are uh, uncovering and describing the next frontier in human biology for um, for the last 65 or so years, we've been looking at the genome with a flashlight, sort of peering around and see what we could see, which turns out is not so much so far. Um, this paper is akin to flipping on the Hubble telescope and seeing the universe present itself uh, to us for the first time. We are seeing, literally, we're up to about 500 million new uh, nucleotide genetic variants, or SNVs, um, and very interestingly, we're finding that 80, every person we sequence contributes 8,500 or so novel variations that have never been seen before in our database, suggesting that mom was actually right when she told you there was no one else in the world quite like you. We are all an experiment in biology. Um, just to give you a sense of the landscape and why um, we need to continue to build the techniques that we use to leverage this information. There's really two do domains of information that we can use. One is looking at single genes or Mendelian genetics, um, which tends to give us mechanistic information, which is very important for diagnosis. Um, and then there's another technique called uh, genome-wide association studies, which gives us primarily epidemiologic data. And this is applied to cancers, but it actually applies across all major domains of common diseases. Uh, we also work on the human microbiome at Human Longevity. Uh, Craig defined this field, and we think we are producing the highest quality available of metagenomic microbiome uh, data. What I'm gonna say at this point is that um, these are very early data, but they're quite provocative. I think the things that we can say that we know for sure at this point 
are that um, this, um, this occurrence where we have 30 trillion human cells running the same software accompanied by another 30 trillion diverse microorganisms in and on our body is not an accident and it is a vitally important part of our human physiology and health. Um, clearly at this point we can say it allows us to use foods, foods for energy that we wouldn't be otherwise able to use and that these bacteria um, secrete and produce vitamins and other substances that are essential for normal physiology in humans. We can say that the microbiome is important in protecting us from other pathogens. We can say that with confidence. And lastly, and maybe most interestingly, a normal colonization with the microbiome after birth is, is indisputably associated with a um, important process of grooming and maturing our immune system so that it has a healthy uh, trajectory in supporting our health. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about machine learning um, as one of our core pieces of infrastructure. Uh, Ricardo Sabatini, I don't think is in the room, was, but was invited. He has a great TED talk on this, on this subject. Um, but we, we did a study um, basically seeing what we could predict uh, from only the whole genome sequence about people. And of course, we do a great job predicting sex. We do a great job predicting height. And it's interesting to note that to predict height um, in humans, it requires looking at five or 600 places in the genome, all of which contribute to our height. Um, we do a good job of predicting weight, but many of us are overachieving our genetic potential at this point, as is the subject. Um, we do a good job on age, looking at telomere length and the loss of sex chromosomes. We can actually report eye color better than people can self-report it. Um, and we can do a very good, good job predicting skin tone. But what we were really after is the ability to predict a photograph quality image of the face. Uh, this is an image that's generated directly from the whole genome sequence. We now have the capability to do this uh, very well across diverse ethnicities. Um, this is the researcher that did much of this work, Ricardo Sabatini, um, who's a quantum physicist and uh, represents the ilk of scientists that has excellent skills in performing this kind of task for us. Uh, Ricardo, of course, could not resist photoshopping a beard onto his face, um, um, but, but uh, people think that this may be sort of a cute parlor trick. This has enormous implications, as I'll talk about with medical imaging uh, and prediction of disease risk. I'll come to in a second. I've talked about three critical pieces of infrastructure that we've built over the last two and a half years at Human Longevity. Our sequencing capability, uh, where we've now done about 34,000 whole genome sequences, we think that it is by an order of magnitude greater than the entire global inventory of such deep whole genome sequences. We're producing those right now um, at a rate of one completed whole genome sequence every 15 minutes. Uh, around the clock. We have essentially infinite scalability of that factory at the present time. We've built our um, computational infrastructure on the Amazon cloud. Everything's on the cloud. Um, and and um, we've demonstrated our ability to store and manipulate data, although the cost of doing that is still really too high to support large scale um, uh, application at this point. We've demonstrated our capability in machine learning. But the fourth piece of infrastructure I want to talk about is our clinical integration infrastructure. And this is also represented by a standalone business that's called the Health Nucleus. We did this for two reasons. One is we thought it was essential to actually build and operate a prototype of what we think health and healthcare are going to look like in the future. Uh, I've had a lot of experience trying to change and alter physician behavior. Unless you have a physical representation of what you're talking about 
and can describe that in the peer-reviewed medical literature, it's very difficult to coax physicians into new behaviors. The second reason we did this is that we wanted to have a uh, laboratory where we could collect high quality clinical or phenotype data that we think was, gonna ap was going to maximally power uh, our ability to combine it with whole genome sequence uh, for clinical decision support. And it turns out, although there's lots of phenotype and clinical data generated in the world, all of it has some serious flaws, um, and we needed a place where we could really collect what we thought was a gold standard. I want to talk a little bit about what our target is for the health nucleus, because as much as I would like to address a lot of the things and concepts that, that are sort of at the further reaches of hyper well-being, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that people are dying unnecessarily as a result of the current medical model. And I think we can fix that or begin to fix that in the near term applying this science and technologies. This is a slide that shows three successive cohorts of individuals born. Um, the blue cohort is born between 1900 and 1902, the yellow between 1949 and 1951, and the red was born in 2010. And it shows very interestingly, I think, very provocatively, the number of people alive at various ages across the x-axis um, over time. And you see the characteristic bulging of that, that curve, which really represents the progress I talked about with infectious disease for the most part and the prevention of early childhood deaths. Our first target is to continue to bulge this line out. We think there's lots of people dying unnecessarily um, that, that we can actually um, uh, alleviate suffering for them, their family, and their community by doing this. But our secondary target and what we think will happen as a natural course of the work we're doing is to actually get beyond that 100-year um, uh, life expectancy. And you see all of those, convert, all those uh, population cohorts are actually converging on the same point there at 100 years of age. Genomics, we think, is the watershed technology that's going to help us get beyond that. And here's, here's an ugly truth. Although we walk around thinking that we're all going to survive to the average life expectancy, 78 in men and 81 in women, many of us don't. Um, a lot of us don't. And that's because a lot of people die prematurely on the left-hand side of that bell curve. And it turns out, um, these are data from 2013 in the United States from the Global Burden of Disease Project. Chris Murray, who's a good friend, um, uh, it turns out that the cumulative mortality rate in U.S. men between the ages of 50 and 74 is 30 percent for men and 20 percent for females. And you can see around this circle the causes of those premature deaths. They are well known and well understood age-related chronic diseases that have a consistent set of characteristics. One is that they have long prodromes before they become symptomatic. Two, they have large components of heritability. So all of them have genetic components um, that are traceable in the whole genome sequence. Um, and three, many of these, if recognized early, are, are um, amenable to lifestyle and other um, interventions uh, that will defer these causes of premature death. Um, and one of the things that is so powerful about genomics, um, and one of my great hopes for the science and technology, is that it has the potential to, to cross a, a divide that exists currently between curative and preventative approaches in medicine by doing both a better job in identifying pathology and doing a better job in identifying risk. And what we're doing in the health nucleus is simply uh, a rearrangement of, of emphasis in the context of a medical model that is both proactive in its curative approach 
and includes preventative medicine. So when we enroll individuals into the health nucleus, and right now this is a direct medical services that's not covered by insurance, it's expensive, it costs $25,000 at this point. Uh, we processed about 400 people through this experience, uh, which involves um, uh, multimodality data gathering that includes the whole genome sequence, microbiome, and metabolomics. A bunch of traditional uh, past medical history and family history, social, environmental, nutrition, and exercise, as well as uh, what we think is going to be the most powerful accompaniment um, to whole genome sequence, and that is three-dimensional imaging focusing on the use of MRI uh, because there's no radiation and we don't use contrast, so there's no medical risk as long as you don't have any metal in your body. Um, this is a brief um, uh, rundown of what we're currently collecting. This is subject to modification going forward. A typical um, EMR today has about three and a half gigs of information. We collect through this experience about 150 gigabytes of information. The whole genome sequence is about 120 gigabytes of that, um, of that uh, total. Um, this is a, uh, a volumetric MRI. We're making a very important transition in the use of imaging data, moving from qualitative measurements to quantitative measurements. I don't have, I don't think I have a pointer, but you see at the bottom of this image, um, uh, the hippocampus is represented on the left in normal. It's sort of that yellowish organ uh, down near the bottom on each side of the brain next to the green, and you see it all shriveled up in Alzheimer's. This um, occurs 10 to 15 years prior to the onset of clinical symptoms um, and can be combined with genomics to give incredible predictive capabilities. Um, we're doing the same thing with cancer detection. We now have, using sort of special, specialized physics in the form of restricted spectrum imaging, the ability to light up malignant lesions in solid tumors that decreases false positives in a, in a pretty important way. Um, this slide shows that capability in a prostate, um, and we're recognizing a lot of stage one and stage two cancer lesions and getting a lot of thank you for saving my life uh, letters from our clients as a result of this early intervention. Uh, we create an avatar of individuals um, that's done on a gaming platform to support mixed and virtual reality to uh, allow them to share this data and for us to constantly update new findings that come uh, from our larger database that are relevant to them. Uh, these are some early um, uh, results. Uh, we'll be publishing a manuscript describing our first 209 clients here shortly. Um, I want to close with, with a, a, a notion that actually Lee uh, um, mentioned is that medicine has been uh, traditionally a clinical science that's been supported by data. We are rapidly approaching a time when medicine is about to become a data science supported by clinicians. So thanks very much. I'm delighted to be here. Hey Brad, uh, can we have just two minutes of Q&A before sure. we uh, move sure. on to Walter? And may I ask? To sure. be the first to ask sure. a question. So when I look at this predictive capability and the cost, I admire the paradigm shift, and that's hence invitation. I'm amazed that so few are uh, aiming to provoke this paradigm shift. But in terms of social stratification, we must begin to acknowledge that it's only for elite members of society to start with. In other words, I think we're moving, it seems to me, we're moving towards a future where a subset of society gets fantastic production, prediction capabilities. Do you agree with that? I certainly hope not. Um, although we're taking care of rich people right now, I think about it, more of it in the, in the sort of Tesla model where we have this new science and technology. It doesn't fit into the current healthcare financing system. So we can either wait for that to happen, or we can actually use a premium price point that some people are willing to pay in order to reduce the cost and learn how to scale this technology. I think this will go through the same 
um, rapid cycle that we've seen with smartphones and, and uh, I think be available at large global scale within the decade. Just briefly, when will the Model 3 be, if we were to put a time scale on it? Um, I think over the next five years. Five years, so soon. Yeah. One question from the audience, and then we'll need to move on. Hi. My question is actually related to the, to the Lee ones. Um, what, what is the price point today? Where, at, what, at what point, point today do you offer the, this kind of service? Is it only for the pharma industry? Or are you also offering that type of services for other avenues? Yeah, so the Health Nucleus is a direct medical services platform that currently sells for $25,000. It's a year-long experience where we work with individuals and their physicians um, to assemble this data um, and, and create a set of integrated recommendations for them going forward. Um, that's going to evolve quite rapidly. Um, and the intent is to use that experience to virtualize uh, our capabilities and get the price uh, down to affordable levels so that increasingly large parts of the population can, can use this technology and science. Thank you. Yeah.